forward, okay? Avinu Makenu, our Father, our King, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for this opportunity that we get to study your word and study Romans and, and Lord, to, to really learn a deeper sense of what the scriptures are teaching us regarding salvation and Messiah and how Messiah works for both the Jewish person and the non-Jewish person for the nations. Lord, for your reconciliation of the world, how you desire to reconcile the entire world, how you draw us in and pull us in and really um, bring, make us one and that the two shall become one. It's such a witness to the world around us. And so, Lord, thank you, Father, for the roles that we have as Jewish people. Thank you, Lord, for the roles that we have as non-Jewish people, Lord. Thank you for those roles that come together and meld together like in marriage. Lord, and that the two shall be one, similar to a married couple where the the man and wife come become one before you, Lord, and, and they get to participate in all the beauty of, of that ceremonial aspect to be married. And it's the same way with Jew and non-Jew in the body of Messiah that we all get to participate and be a part of this oneness of walking with you. And so, Lord, we give you glory and praise for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the wisdom that you've uh, in place into Paul and the words that you had him pen and, and lead uh, us into a greater reality of who you are in Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Malka Olam, asher kirishana b'mitzvotah, v'tivanu la'asok divrei Torah. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God, ruler of the universe, who, who, who sanctifies us in your commandments and instructs us in in uh, studying your word amen hallelujah okay so jacob you had your hand raised what would you like to add if anything weird i'm cutting you off tonight no no i'm just joking really no square dancing again no square dancing. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> all right no oh, I, will, I gotta do cotton eye joe at my wedding it's just gotta happen so um uh, so I was thinking, like, you know, when you were saying about, like, his God or, you know, uh, like, you know, God being the God of, anyway, what I'm saying is I feel like my people sometimes take God, you know, take the Father, um, they're all God, but they take the Father and they go, he's our God, and they're like, but he's not the God of the Gentiles, and they're like, Jesus is their God, and I'm like, what is happening, and, you know, it's like, God, God, all of them is God of everybody. He created everybody. So there's this kind of like the violent, like if you want our God, you have to come into like, be, you have to convert. And I'm like, this is just like, makes no sense. Yeah, it is. And that's the kind of the Meshugana that has happened over 2000 years of really, um, where we have the church going one direction, Judaism going another direction. And it's gotten to the point where it's real comfortable. It's like, well, Jesus might be the Messiah of the Gentiles, but he's not the Messiah of the Jewish people. And you're okay to be in your corner, but and we're in our corner. And you play nicey nice over here, and we'll play nicey nice over here. And and that is still a wall that has been put up between the two, where God is trying to draw us together to be one and and truly to to walk in that unity that we have without that pressure for somehow the the church to be Jewish and for the Jewish people to be a non-Jewish reality. There is there's room for both, and I think that's it's a beautiful expression that we call today messianic judaism um you know but there prior to messianic judaism prior to the 70s and the 60s when messianic judaism was really getting defined um we see a lot of uh, hebrew christians that were involved in the church and there was some rabbis uh believe it or not orthodox rabbis like uh, jews for jesus and the chosen people ministries a lot of those ministries started a long time ago by a orthodox rabbi or orthodox rabbis that would not leave their post they got saved when they were an orthodox rabbi in a community and they would not leave their posts and they endured i mean people would throw stones at them would holler at them people were still coming to their services but they did not deny yeshua but they had no they had there no there was nothing like messianic judaism at that time and there's always been jewish people who believed in yeshua so there's always been this remnant of of jewish believers but many of them had to just, by default, had to be a part of the church. And so they kind of became the token Jew, or they became a Hebrew Christian, or a, a Jewish Christian, or something like that, even though a lot of times their heart wanted to still follow the traditions of their fathers. And so it wasn't really defined until you guys, how many have seen the Jesus Revolution since that came out? Uh, did, has anybody gone to go see that that movie? Um, I, it's a great movie. It's really amazing if you guys haven't seen it. But in the G Jesus Revolution... Uh, during that time, about that same time, just a little bit before that, but during that time, 
a lot of Jewish people were getting saved. Um, so it just wasn't a Christian movement that was happening. Jewish people were getting saved like crazy. And, and they were like, wait, wait, he's the Messiah. He's the Jewish Messiah. Why do we have to stop being Jewish? And so there became more of a desire to, to be within their culture. And, and that's kind of where Messianic Judaism started. At first, a lot of people kind of misplaced Messianic Judaism. Oh, you guys are just being legalistic. You guys are just being, you know, you're following the law. There was a lot of stuff that was said about Messianic Judaism when it first came out. But it was also defining itself. It's like, wait, how can we walk in unity as Jewish people and non-Jewish people together like they did in the first century? like they did in biblical times and so there's that mindset it's like how do we how do we walk in unison together and how do we grow together in unison as jewish people and non-jewish people without forsaking our traditions and also without forcing people to somehow adapt a uh controlled jewish aspect to their lives in the sense of you know we see it very clearly that jews don't i mean non-jews don't have to get circumcised so how do we go through that process and how do we have that melding together of Jew and Gentile? And it's 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 been it's been an interesting road. <laughs> it's been a really really interesting road. But today, you know, I would say 15 years ago, hardly would you find a a messianic rabbi that had a doctoral degree or had uh, any kind of real major education behind him. And so you're seeing scholarship grow tremendously, especially in the last 15 years. Uh, and and also schools that are offering degrees uh, for in that follow a messianic track and uh some quality schools and quality teachers quality scholars out there um so it's pretty cool so uh we're growing and growing and growing and getting to a place where we're getting more and more defined the church has opened up their doors more and more to welcoming messianic jews in their in their presence and and we're seeing a, a lot of work going together on that uh chuck chuck meisler who passed away not too long ago he was really involved in, in connecting uh, Jack Hayford, who just passed away with Foursquare. He just passed away recently. He was very involved in, in working with the Messianic Jewish people in Israel. You had something that you wanted to add? Well, I was just making a comment on verse 29. Rather, the Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart. So being a Gentile, as far as I know, um, this verse could cause me to say, if I wanted to, that I'm a Jew inwardly. So where is that, you know, is that a plus or a minus or what's... Have you... it, it, it basically is saying here that you're justified in your faith in Messiah alone, that that's not what makes you Jewish is the outward circumcision and stuff. It's like it's inside. So it's not saying that you're Jewish, you know, because now somehow you believe in Jesus, you're Jewish. It's simply saying that you have all the rights and the fulfillment of any Jewish person because you've gone through the circumcision of salvation, right? The circumcision in there. So it's puts you on the same status. So imagine this if like, you know, in the military, they don't have any, they have ranks in the military, right? <laughs> and if an ensign E1 uh, just out of boot camp is walking around, he doesn't salute a commander coming by, man, drop and give me 50. And he can even get written up and all that kind of stuff. It's like in Messiah, it's like those, though that specialty, there's still certain callings and ranks that we have in ministry, but you know, like for instance, there's still rabbis and non-rabbis and all that. But basically the status for both the Jew and the non-Jew, if you're a non-Jew, you basically become like a Jew inwardly because you've accepted the issue and did everything you can, and you're walking in unison with any Jewish person that has accepted Yeshua as the Messiah. There is no distinction between those two when it comes to salvation. So that's what it's saying. It's like inwardly, you are a Jew just like any Jew because You've gone through the right, the, the right passage, you know, R-I-T-E. You've gone through the, what is that? Uh, somebody said the, the rite of passage, mm -hmm. the rite of passage. So that's kind of what that word is saying there. Oops, there's some people in the waiting room. I better let, <laughs> sorry guys, they're probably, they've probably been sitting there for 10 minutes. <laughs> come in, come in. <laughs> oh, that's, I'm such a bad guy. <laughs> All right, so. Anyhow, that's a good question. So it, that's kind of what it's saying. So when it says it there, guys, it's not like all of a sudden you wake up one day, you get saved, you wake up the next day and you have to start wearing peyote and start walking around and start davening at everything, you know, and, you know, and, and lift it. every time you pick up a glass of coffee, you're saying, you know, or, or you know, it, it is, you, you don't have to start becoming Jewish and going through all the customs and doing all that kind of stuff it's you've become on the same plane as any Jewish person with salvation in Messiah Yeshua and you can approach the throne of grace boldly 
you can approach God with all the givens, totally being uncircumcised because you've been cleansed through, you've been circumcised of the heart, that you can you can partake in a Passover Seder. You can partake of coming to the throne of God. So it's it's a beautiful thing. It's 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 the reconciliation of the nations back to the Father God. And that, that's what's beautiful there. Cool. So let's start uh, chapter three here. And then we'll go forward. So this is really good. So then what advantage has the Jew? Uh-oh. So, so that was a good question. So Linda led us into this thing. Okay, well, if I'm Jew inward, what's the big deal? <laughs> so here's where Paul is trying to say it's a, it's a community of two coming together. So what is the advantage that the Jew has? Or what is the value of circumcision? And he says, much in every way. For in the first place, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. So the word of God was entrusted on the Jewish people. And we know uh, if anybody has studied a uh, textual uh, understanding of the scriptures, the Jewish people were very, very uh, meticulous on how they copied and transmitted the Torah from generation to generation to generation to generation. And one, one, uh, one discovery that proved all of this was the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1950s when they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. There was a little few discrepancies in the book of Isaiah, but it had to do with more of the alphabet usage at that time. Okay, so the way the alphabet is played out, like the there are certain um, consonants um, in in Hebrew that are used as vowels. Those have always been the case, but sometimes there's a shortened form to those vowels today that you don't need a consonant in there. But in the ancient Hebrew, you had more of those consonants in there. So those consonants were used more so because they don't use the nikud. The nikud wasn't invented. The nikud are the vowels. Uh, the nikud is the vowel system that, that's in the Hebrew. That wasn't invented until many, many years later. So all of Hebrew at one time was just nothing but consonants. So these consonants, so that's the discrepancies you would see. You know, um, there's other discrepancies as well. But the but the Dead Sea Scrolls showed the meticulous pattern that the Jews did when they transmitted the word of God. It was absolutely amazing. And so typically the one Torah scroll, it takes, so when you guys see us with the big Torah scroll up there, it takes 70 sheepskins to do a Torah scroll. Okay. And they're sewed together. So it's a leather parchment and it's sewed together. And we're going to need some, uh, some uh, uh, maintenance on ours. It's kind of, there's some areas where it's like, Ooh, it's scary. You know, it looks like it's going to uh, pull apart. Um, and so it's 70, 70 sections of lambs, like a side of a lamb. And it's there, it's there, there, it's turned into parchment. Okay. It's sewed together. And so if, if the scribes made one error on that, they would unsew that one piece and then they have to take that piece and then have to uh, basically burn it and they had to get rid of it. There was certain ways that they had to take care of it. Then they would have to start all over again. So the good news is they didn't have to go, you know, look, can you imagine being on the last chapter of the Torah, you know, <laughs> and make a mistake and feel like, oh, my gosh, I got to go all the way back to bear a sheep and start all over again. It wasn't like that. They had to start. But, you know, if they were almost on the last line of that parchment, which holds uh, three columns for the most part, three columns of, of, of scripture, and you get to the back, the last one, and you make a mistake, you have to take that whole thing and redo it all over again, so there was, uh, there was a lot of schooling and tough, so it says here, so what, this has something to do with the Jewish people, so our job, so much in every way, for in the first place, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God, what if some were unfaithful, will their, will their faithfulness nullify the faith, the faithfulness, will their faithfulness Nullify the faithfulness of God by no means. Although everyone is a liar, let God be proved true as it is written so that you may be justified in your words and prevail in your judging. So it's saying here that even if even if they destroyed uh, some of this, even if they made bad decisions, does it make God? Uh, does does that mean God made bad a bad decision? No, by no means. So so that's kind of what basically what it's saying. It says, but if our injustice serves to confirm the justice of God, what should we say? that God is unjust to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. And this is where Peter and other people are saying, man, he's hard to understand. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my falsehood, God's truthfulness abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? So it's basically saying here is that God doesn't base his decisions and salvation on what we do as people one way or the other or how we fail or not his word holds true and we've he's given us a task and he's going to hold to that task 
and and it doesn't matter kind of really it's like it's it's based off of his covenant it's based off of his beliefs and 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 that kind of thing so uh thomas you have your hand raised yeah my understanding of this let me lower my hand here um he's kind of putting an argument up at least he's starting one right here this is my understanding of this chapter of, uh, of romans and what he's saying is let me get my thought here together correctly a lot of the doctrine of our of the 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 mainstream church is if i sin my sin makes god more righteous and Paul's saying that that isn't what's really going on here. Even though a great deal of our churches, it's like, well, you know, you, you caused a sin, but look how righteous God is by forgiving you. And if that's the case, then we're on a sliding scale. However unrighteous man is, the, the righteousness of God would vary depending on how unrighteous man is. And so we can't say that because we sin that makes god more glorious but if you listen to a lot of preachers out there that's exactly what they're saying is you're, you're forgiven of your sin now look how great god is for for forgiving you and that that's really a, a misnomer into it um there there's it's paul says a lot of things in this chapter that are kind of like an argument against a straw man and he's tearing down this man, the, the straw man's argument throughout this whole chapter. And this is kind of the beginning of it. I, I think that this is the start of it where he says, we can't assume that because of our sins, God becomes more righteous because God's righteousness, if that was the case, then if man didn't sin, how would we prove God's righteousness? So I, 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 I'm sorry, <laughs> I love this book. And I, I've, I've studied this book for hours and hours. And so I, I love to listen to you. And 99% and of the time we agree on everything and I, I love it. So I appreciate it. <laughs> well, you're welcome. Well, and I think that you have a lot of stuff there and that you said that is really good that you have in there that it really is defined true. But you're, I think you're right in the sense that somehow we, we have this concept that our unrighteousness makes God more righteous, but you can't make a, a the righteousness of God any more righteous than what it already is he's righteous and his standard of righteousness we will never meet and I think it shows the frailty of mankind here and what he's saying here is he goes if will their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God by no means and and that's where he's saying to the Jewish people so what he's saying now imagine he's speaking to the non-Jewish people here in Rome that are part of a, a group of, of Jewish people as well as non-Jewish people. He's saying, hey, listen, when you see these guys do things that you don't quite um, understand or you don't quite accept or agree with or they make it, they do a sin, it's, 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 it's like we, we don't put them on a pedestal because God is greater than this. He's greater than this, but at the same time, you have to understand they're just merely human beings, and they've been given a task and a job and a duty to do. Um, does that does that make sense, Thomas? Did that help? Uh, that's kind of a, how I see that as well. I think you have a better way of putting it than I do. Sometimes, I mean, your the thoughts in my head sometimes don't come out of my mouth as well as what I I know them in my head. Um, yeah, but it's so, kind of like you, you pretty much. Yeah. It's kind of like this. Let's say uh, Rebecca. We have two Rebeccas on here tonight. So we'll just say Rebeccas. Okay, so the two Rebeccas are preaching the gospel to their family members. And their family members say, well, what, what makes you so righteous now? I mean, look at you. Look, at, I remember you back and da 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 And they start throwing everything that you've done bad at, at your face. And, and, and this is kind of like the thing that, that I think Paul's getting across to these uh, to the Romans is listen just because you may have seen unrighteousness among them doesn't mean they have not been given a, a job by the Lord and it doesn't mean that they have not been set free and they have a responsibility before the Lord so in the same kind of sense we'd say well you know if your family members were doing that to you and say I mean I remember when I first got saved and I became this massive evangelist of just preaching the gospel to my parents and everybody like man Adrian, what are you talking about you were just like promiscuous just like two weeks ago I know yeah I know but I've been set free I've been forgiven I can't believe it this is great man and it's like 
So it's not so much of saying like, look how, how bad I am and therefore God is so good. It's like God is so good regardless of how bad I am. And now he's brought me into that light and I'm excited about it. And that's kind of what Paul is getting across. Shaul is getting across to these guys here in Rome is saying, listen, just because their unfaithfulness does not mean God's not faithful. Um, and just because you've seen them walk into an area that doesn't seem right or doesn't or they have sinned doesn't mean that God is not able to take them out of that and put them into the calling that he has. But he does say they've been given the words of the Lord or the oracle. Some translations, what does some translations say? It doesn't say the oracles of God. It's, some says the word of God, correct? Um, uh, let's see. It says, first of all, they were entrusted with the sayings of God. So that's what the TLV says, the sayings of God. Some 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 uh, translations say the word of God. Um, all right, so let's let's move on there. So it's basically saying here, don't judge God by the failures and the weaknesses of man. That's really what it, it boils down to. Um, and it says, um, where am I at? Uh, verse seven. Maybe? Am I at verse seven? Yeah, let's read verse five again. But if our injustice serves to confirm the justice of God, what should we say? That God is unjust to inflict wrath on us? I speak in human ways. So he says, by no means. For then how could God judge the world? So God's righteousness is at a place where only he can judge the world. We're not called to judge the world. And that's where we have to come from. We have to really have an attitude. You remember I shared with you guys a few weeks back. I don't, I don't know if we were talking about Romans at the time or not. But typically when God, when somebody has hurt us or somebody has offended us and, and we follow the Matthew 18 principle where it says, if, if there's someone who has uh, mm -hmm. sinned against you, please, you go to them one-on-one. -on -one. Before you ever go to them one-on-one, -on -one, you already want to have a heart of forgiveness and you've already wanted to have already forgiven them before you ever approach them and ask for forgiveness on there or reveal to them what they said or what they did that hurts you. And your heart should always be ready and right to go to that person type of thing and that's kind of what's going on here is that regardless of of our failures it doesn't diminish god's faithfulness right it doesn't diminish god's faithfulness and uh, okay here's a good example when he told abraham you'll be a father of many nations they became unfaithful him and sarah became unfaithful because they tried to do it on their own means they, they so you know she gave she gave her handmaid into to abraham hagar and then she had ishmael right and and it wasn't god's that wasn't god's choice so they they tried to push god's will and tried to force it to happen and they had to pay the consequences of that obviously there was a relationship breakdown between uh, uh sarah and, and her handmaiden there was a breakdown in their marriage i don't know if you guys knew that just reading in this in the scriptures in genesis when sarah died abraham had to leave and go get sarah at the end of their life, Abraham was not with Sarah when she passed away. I mean, that's really interesting. It's like there, there must have been so much strife that was caused from them trying to do that, um, that they weren't even together. So Abraham had to go and get her and then bring her back and then bury her in the tomb of the fathers and stuff like that. And it's, it's, it's interesting. So when we try to force God's ways into our life, when, even if it's, it's a word of God that God has given us, we, we're kind of, we're kind of uh, playing God in a way right that's really what it boils down to i think we're trying to play god and we, we're not we shouldn't do that so okay so anyhow by more uh god judge the world verse seven but if through my falsehood god's truthfulness abounds to his glory why am i still being condemned as a sinner so he's just he's basically saying god is great god is great and don't bind me as a sinner because his greatness has forgiven me as a sinner and why not say as some people slander us by saying that we say let us do evil so that good may come their condemnation is deserved. So here's what he's basically saying is you're breaking um, the, what, which commandment is it? The third commandment, you should not, or the second commandment, you should not use God's fault name falsely or should not use God's name in vain, right? Um, uh, that's basically what he's saying is like, okay, just because God is good, I can sin and I can do whatever I want. And I could just, you know, it doesn't matter because God's greatness supersedes my greatness and and you can't blame me for being a bad person <laughs> no it's it's we're not called to, to slander god or misuse the name of god we if if we are in the covenant of god and we are called into this forgiveness and we're into this place with the lord we have a standard that we're supposed to live by and that's really what he's saying here and he's saying that people who live like the devil and call themselves believers 
um, their condemnation is deserved. And, and that's what he's saying. It's not, it's not a game. It's not something that we should take lightly here is that if God has set us free, we walk in that freedom in him and not in the freedom to, to, to walk away from him and say, I'm good to go. Right. It's, you know, if you get a hair, I'm, we have to get haircuts all the time. If we don't get haircuts, our hair, our hair will go out of control. Right. If we don't observe uh, if we don't observe the speed limit every single day, we're in danger of getting arrested for not following the speed limit, for not following the laws. So we're called to uphold a standard of righteousness every single day in our lives, every single day in our lives, because we belong in the light. We belong to the light, not in darkness. So anyhow, hope, hopefully get, people are catching that. And he's saying here, I'm speaking on human terms. So he's he's getting across to us. We should understand what he's what he's saying. So what then? Are we are we any better off? So again, here he's still talking about Jew. He says, no, not at all, for we have already charged that all. Okay, everybody highlight this, underline this, put it in your in your scriptures. Um, okay, we have to see this, that all, both Jews and Greeks, or Jews and non-Jews, or Jews and Gentiles, whatever translation you have, are under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. There is no one who has understanding. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who shows kindness. There is not even one. This is powerful. Then it says their throats are open grave, opened graves. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their paths, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's heavy-duty stuff. So it says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So again, this is a lot of language. This is really wild what, what Shaul is saying here. But what he's basically getting across is that there's not one who is righteous. Not one. Jew or Greek or none of them. None of them are, there's, there, we all stand on the same level with God because our, our hearts are deceptive, our minds are deceptive. You know, we want to do good. We always strive to do good, especially once we're believers. We, we, make, we try to make every great decision that we possibly can. But you look at little children, and I'll tell you, I've seen little kids, like two years old, three years old, four years old, do some horrific stuff. And you're like, whoa. Whoa, I thought children were innocent. <laughs> I thought children were like sweet and kind. <laughs> you know what? You can pay me $5 billion and I will never, if they said, I will give you $5 billion to live your 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 uh, junior high and high school experience all over again, I would say no way. I'd rather beg for food. I'd rather beg for bread on the street than ever relive my junior year school, my junior high school years. I mean, I'm telling you, junior high was brutal. It was brutal. And some of the things that are said and the way that uh, the girls pick on the girls and the guys pick on the guys and the fighting and the pecking order and the teasing and the, the bully. I mean, I, I don't ever want to go back to that. <laughs> right. I don't think there's any if, if you have a desire to do that, we need to count. We need there needs to be some counseling because it's a morbid way of thinking. I think <laughs> it's or, just very a, brave. or you're very brave. Yeah. you're, Or you have a martyr gift. You just want to go in there and get beat up all over again. <laughs> <laughs> okay so uh, but anyhow what he's saying here is that at the very heart of man since the fall and since genesis chapter at the very heart of it we're, we're not good we're not righteous and there's a passage in the tanakh that says our righteousness is as filthy or as filthy rags before the lord and and we know that that translation i wish other translations would just come out and say it we know that that is minstrel cycle uh, rags. It's it's minstrel rags. And so our righteousness is just nothing before the Lord. So it's all about him. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, we all stand on that level of needing that salvation to cleanse us from that sin. And this is where Paul's coming from. So it's just, just because we have the oracles of God, the saints of God, and just because we're called to a special calling as Jewish people doesn't make us righteous before the Lord. We're found, we're made righteous before the Lord in Yeshua, just like the non-Jews are made righteous before the Lord in Yeshua. 
And that's where he's going with this. And then you look at verse nine again, and he says, so basically all the stuff he says there kind of goes to that. And he says, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Again, we've talked about what that means to be under the law. To be under the law means that we've broken the law. We've sinned. And that's kind of the theme that Paul is showing here. It's that our unrighteousness puts us underneath the law in the sense that we are held accountable for not walking out according to God's ways, right? So if you're walking according to God's ways, you're not breaking the law. It's only when you break the law that the law falls on you and that, then you become under the law. So we talked about that in, in a few weeks back. And just even on this, this episode here is we know that when we break the speed limit, and the cop pulls us over, we've just become under the law. You know, uh, uh, one of my sons right now is facing some things that he, he's got some choices he's got to make because he made such a bad decision years ago. It's been almost six years ago now. He made a bad decision six years ago uh, by drinking and driving, and that's limiting him to what he can do today and the decisions he can make today because of something he did six years ago. Isn't it beautiful that God has forgiven us of those things and have allowed those things? But so when we make bad decisions, we're under the law. So when we commit murder, the law falls. We, we fall under the law at that point. When we commit adultery, we fall under the law. That's why we need the righteousness. Now, that doesn't. And, and so when you jump back up here to what, what uh, Thomas was saying, and you look back at the other passages, especially in verse 8, when he says, And why not say, as some people slander us by saying that we say this? Let us do evil so that good may come. You know, it's like, well, if God is just so great, let's just be who we are because he's going to cover our sins anyhow. So we might as well just do whatever we're going to do. That's what he's saying here. So if you put it in a modern understanding, it's like, well, why keep the speed limit? What, why, who cares about sleeping around on your wife? Who cares about living together before you get married? Who cares about all this stuff? God's good anyhow, and God's going to forgive me and his greatness is there. You guys see the morbid thinking on that? This is if we do that today in our day day and age in our culture today, don't we think that they would have done the same back in those days as well? Because human nature is human nature. And so Paul's Paul's addressing this and he's doing it in a beautiful way. It's very hard for us to understand, but he's basically being uh, just basically saying, guys, you can't live like the devil and call yourselves a believer. You just can't do it. We all know that if we choose to live that way, we all fall underneath the law. We if we sin the 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 righteousness of god will come down against us because of our sin and that's really what paul is just saying here it's he's, he's it's a very basic idea that he's saying here but he's speaking very scholarly in this too and so it can get confusing with that anybody everybody catching that anybody have any questions okay good good all right so let's move on there so he says um uh, verse 20 for no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So he's just basically saying you can't uphold just the law itself and be found righteous and justified just in doing the deeds of the law. And he goes, because the law is just simply there to identify sin. And that's really what it is. And we, and we get away from that, that general meaning. That's one thing that we do a lot. We get away from that general meaning. You know, it's like we feel like, okay, man, if I could just, you know... Maybe, you know, if I just wear my seat seat just right, and if I have enough curls on my tail, just, you know, that one last curl, you know, if my yarmulke is is black now, you know, I'm more orthodox in the Lord, so I need to wear a black yarmulke. Um, you know, if I get up and I say my shacharit, my morning prayers and my afternoon prayers, and I go to the temple three times a day, and if I can do all this stuff, I can find righteousness before God. Paul is saying, this isn't what makes you right before the Lord. This isn't what does it. For, for the Lord. What does it here? And he's saying here, he goes, if that was the case, he goes, that would be great. But all that the Torah does is acknowledge and reveal sin in our lives. So it's when we sin, and then we read in the Torah that it says, remove ourselves from sin. So if we commit adultery, and somebody says, you've committed adultery, well, how do we know we've committed adultery? Because the word, the righteousness of the word says we've committed adultery. It defines what adultery is. And then all of a sudden, you are found yourself the knowledge of this sin is what leads us to repent or the kindness of God. And we take this repentance or this, this sin that we have. And we come before the father and we say, Lord, forgive me. I have been found by your word, by your law, 
I've been found and I've been revealed to be an adulterer. Will you please forgive me? That's the beautiful part of it. And he's saying all human beings, everybody, Jew and non-Jew, are in, in this same case. Because the righteousness of God isn't what, following the Torah isn't what makes us holy. Okay, the, the Torah itself reveals our unrighteousness. So we come before the Lord. So the Lord is the one who makes us holy. The forgiveness and the cleansing of the Holy Spirit and the forgiveness and the the plant the the shed of God Yeshua's blood on the cross and 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 the death and the resurrection that's what makes us holy. And but we're so called to walk in that righteousness. Everybody there? Everybody with me on that? Sound good? Okay, good. Okay, excellent. So we're here, uh, verse twenty one. But now, apart from the law, the righteous God has been disclosed and and is attested by the law and the prophets. So he's just basically saying, so those who are outside of the law, so let's say, meaning uh, non-Jews, okay, so apart from the law, so the non-Jews out there, through the prophets of God, and through all the stuff that is around them, and through the word, and all this kind of stuff, the law of God, the righteousness of God is made known even to them, okay, so that's kind of where he's going, the righteousness of God through faith in Yeshua the Messiah for all who believe, for there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, for they are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Messiah Yeshua, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. Again, faith is an action word in Hebrew. Faith is an activating word in Hebrew. So by faith, you believe. So by faith, you come before the Lord and you accept him as, as the Messiah. Um, you, you do everything you can to walk in that, that, that faith. But it causes you to do something and to believe in something that's greater than yourself. But basically, this is saying exactly what I was just saying, that that there is no distinction when it comes to salvation and becoming clean. And and uh, like Linda started with the question you had in chapter two, inward circumcision is what makes you puts you on that same level as any Jewish person when we come before the Lord. So Jew and Gentile doesn't really matter what we are. We are we become one in Messiah and we have the same rights of Messiah through that through that righteousness who that is only found in Yeshua the Messiah through faith. So that's really, really good. Everybody catch that? This is great. It's all about the atonement here. It's not talking about our roles. And so this word distinction, don't don't misuse this. This doesn't mean that there's not a distinction between Jew and Gentile. There's a specific calling. For the Jewish people and a specific calling for the non-Jews. And we're going to see that later on as Paul talks about it. But he's saying when it when it comes to salvation and it comes to walking in freedom and walking uh in the freedom of the law and, and walking according to God's ways, there's no distinction as a Jewish person or as a non-Jew. So that put that's beautiful for us. And that puts us all into a beautiful place where you have to understand that you don't have to have some kind of Jewish heritage from your great, 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 great grandmother, you know, and you have one person, hey, I got 1% Jewish blood in me, therefore I'm a Jew, you know, type of thing. There's no need for that. There's no need for that. And vice versa there, you know, it's like, you know, what's funny is the person who was discovered of not finding any Jewish blood in him, he was disappointed. But I told him, why? Your calling is just as important as mine. And I know, but I was really hoping to be Jewish. And I go, well, yeah, but that's like a Jew saying, I was really hoping to be Gentile. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's like, be excited about what God has called you in because only he has placed you into this world in the, I mean, we didn't get to choose. Nobody got to choose how they were born or where they were born or what heritage we have, right? But God has placed us in those, those positions for a reason. And so we should, if you're Jewish, you embrace that calling as a Jewish person. If you're non-Jewish, you embrace that calling as a non-Jew because it's just as important or even more important than what we have. And both of them come together and it's a beautiful thing. Jacob, you had your hand raised. I just wanted to say that like something that's really hard to explain to people in the Orthodox community and in general with Jewish people is that their works don't make them righteous. They fall into this system where they, they have a, a works-based system where they think, oh, they did their good deed for the day. Or, or if they do this many deeds that the rabbis told them to, then they're good before God. And I'm like, it's hard to explain to them. No, it's your faith. It's your faith that makes you well. Because they'll tell you, they'll tell you that Abraham was the father of good works. But without you take a 75-year-old man who literally had never heard the voice of God and God tells him to go to another country and he leaves his town, like that's faith. <laughs> yeah, that's not a good, yeah, that's not through 
a righteous deed. That's that's faith. He believed in God. You know, um, yeah, and that's that's what puts us all on the same uh, level. And it's all done by, by faith. And he says it in here. He says effective through faith. So all of this stuff is nothing without having faith in Messiah. And that's where, um, you know, where we, where it's very important for us to understand. So whether our righteousness as a Jewish person or our righteousness as a non-Jewish person, they really don't mean much if Messiah is not involved in this. Messiah has to be involved in this. And then this has to be activated through faith. And it says faith is the substance of the things hoped for in the certainty of what things i can't remember off the top of my head how it exactly says but basically what it's saying is that you're not believing in just nothing you're you have there's substance to what you believe and then you act it out in faith so if you believe yeshua is the messiah of your life you activate that faith or that belief through faith by allowing him to lead you and to guide you and direct you and to walk according to his ways that's the action of faith not so much all the little deeds that are important. You know, it's like, it, it always cracks me up when when um, it's easy for us sometimes to forget the ultimate goal. Like, uh, let's say some a family, and this is the only thought that can come to mind, but I have to try to explain it this way. Let's say your family is going up to Disney World, up to Orlando, right? But you're so concerned about getting to, to Disney World and getting there on time and and taking the kids, you know, forcing all the kids to go fast and do all this kind of stuff and run out there and they get in the car and you're yelling and screaming and one kid has to pee and you got to stop again. You got to pull over for that. By the time you get to Orlando, nobody even wants to go to Disneyland. Nobody's even in a good mood. You forgot the whole purpose of going to Disneyland in the first place was to have fun with your family and to just enjoy it and, and do whatever and just go along and enjoy the, the road or enjoy the, the day. I think in our lives, we can get so technical for all the little details of the Torah and all the little details of following God's ways that we forget the joy of the Lord and we forget the love for one another. You know what I mean? It's that we get so technical on the little things, you know, um, you know, it's like, just enjoy it. Sometimes it's just, just enjoy, just enjoy the ride. And sometimes the ride is the, the journey is, is the process of having the fun in it and walking according to God's ways. So, okay. So anyhow, enough of me blabbling on, let's move on. <laughs> okay. So, all right. So, um, where are we at? Verse, uh, verse 25. No, wait, through faith he did. Uh, let's see verse. Okay. Yeah. Verse 25, whom God put forward, uh, as a sacrifice of atonement, talking about Yeshua by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show the righteous, his righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's thank the Lord for that. Hallelujah. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Yeshua. Okay, let me let me speak on to that of going back. And it says up here that one that says, it says right here, he did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed we're getting ready to celebrate passover pesach now there's an egyptian word and you guys remember me speaking on this last year for some of you that are attending uh beth Yeshua for more than a year last year i was talking about there's an egyptian word called pasach okay so you have pasach and then you have pesach, pesach is the hebrew word or the part participation or the lamb so you have the pesach which is the lamb that's that's what passover is all about but this there's an egyptian word that plays like it's kind of a word play that means to hover over and cover okay so yeshua not only became the passover lamb but in the process of passing becoming the passover lamb he hovered over like a chick like a mother chicken covering her hands and protecting them from from the fiery flames of the enemy okay so the death angel comes down yeshua covers over so he covers us over all that death and all that sin that came down for passover so you have this he this egyptian word that talks about this hovering or or this covering like the atonement type of thing that takes on the death angel's curse to, to kill all the firstborn and in the process of that, we partake of the Pesach. So you have the Pesach and the Pesach. The Pesach is the Passover lamb. So you're celebrating the Passover lamb while you're being covered by all the uh, all the attacks of the death angel and the enemy above trying to destroy. And so you see Yeshua as a mother hen 
hovering, hovering over the sin that was coming down on the Egyptians and the people. So you guys see this picture here? So you see a twofold picture that's taking place here. One's an Egyptian word, one's a Hebrew word. And this covering is pretty powerful because it's taking on the fiery flames of the enemy. And yet underneath, we're rejoicing the Lord and having Passover. Okay, because he's our Passover lamb. So now fast forward that to the cross. Fast forward that to the work of the cross or the Messiah. And what do you see here is you see Yeshua on the cross taking on the sins of the world. So again, doing the hovering over during Passover, doing the hovering over, and yet his people get to partake in the Lamb of God. So he's taking on the sins of the world, and then we get to partake of the Lamb of God. So we have the salvation of the Lamb of God, and we're being protected and covered by the by the attack of the enemy that wants to destroy us and, and really take us down. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And this is kind of what, how you can see uh, Paul kind of thinking in that first century term. Paul's he he's seeing this 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 uh, fulfillment of Pesach of Passover in his writings here. You can see these overtones in these writings. That are here that a lot of times is missed just in the church because there's not a Jewish background to some of these ideas or understanding. And so it's missed sometimes in here. But when you read some of this language and you have any kind of Messianic Jewish background or you have any kind of Jewish background and you've studied anything about the feast and the festivals or you've participated in the feast and festivals for many, many years being in Messianic Judaism like Linda, these overtones kind of start coming out and they're beautiful. It's like these overtones are amazing. Um Sorry, my dog keeps wanting to come up, so we got to put him up here. So uh, I think he wants to come up. He keeps looking like he wants to come up. Okay, so these are the overtones. I hope he doesn't have to use the restroom and he's trying to get us. He's, he's looking at us. Okay, so so anyhow, that's kind of where I wanted to go with that, just to bring that up so you guys can see that, um, hovering over that. So we're in verse 27 now. Or did anybody have a question of what I said there or a comment? Because it's pretty powerful image imagery that we're seeing here. And I hope you guys are capturing that. And it's based off of an Egyptian word that I think that was incorporated into the Hebraic understanding of what Passover is all about. So it's pretty cool. Um, you know, so, okay, so we got that. Um, let's see, justifies the one who has faith in Yeshua. Then verse 27, then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By what? By that of works. No but by the law of faith. And that's really what it comes down. So we have nothing to boast about. It's all been favored. It's all been through Yeshua. It's all been the work on the cross. It's all about him. And this is where Jacob was talking about. It's really hard to talk to this about, about especially among uh, Orthodox Jewish people, part of the Chabad, um, all that kind of, it's very difficult to talk to people who are, who, who are really basing their, their walk with that. Now, you know what? Christians are the same way too. There's, there's sections or sects of Christianity that really have a lot of works that are involved in that stuff. And it's really, really hard to talk to them about the fact that, wait, you, your faith in Messiah and the law of faith, the law of faith of, 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 of trusting your whole life to someone and believing on the, the Messiah is what makes us righteous. It's really hard for them to understand that. Now, James even goes a little bit more into that saying, show me your faith and I'll show you my works. And he's saying that they go hand in hand, but you're not righteous just by works. You're righteous by Yeshua and by the grace of Yeshua first and foremost. And because you're righteous through Yeshua and he's, he's covering over that sin that we deserve and he's allowing us to partake of the Passover lamb, that faith activated in trusting him and walking according to his ways is what really sets us free. And so there's no boasting about it. I love it. There's no so there's no boasting about being Jewish. There's no boasting about being non-Jewish. There's no boasting about how great of a sinner we are. <laughs> there should never be a boasting of that. They say, "Hey, man, the more I sin, the more God's grace abounds, and the more I sin, uh, yeah, I mean, I, the, hey, man, if I keep sinning, you know, I, I'm set free in the blood of the Lamb. Anyhow, and the, there's no boasting in that. There's no boasting. It's humility, if anything. Okay. And then there's no boasting in your righteous deeds because none of this matters. It's all about Yeshua and the work of, of salvation and the work of redemption. Amen. That is awesome. And I think if we hold to that, we'll see how beautiful that is. So verse 28, for we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from works prescribed by the law or is God the God of the Jews only. So I love that. I love that. Here's where he brings in the non-Jews right to up to speed with the Jewish people saying it's not about 
uh, it's not about being Torah observant or Jewish or anything like that. He's saying that we are we are considered justified by faith through the Messiah and trusting in him and, and not necessarily doing the law or deeds. Now, he's not dismissing the law here. So I, I want you guys to understand this is not a dismissal of the law of God. This is basically saying the law of God has its place and that place is to reveal sin. And that place is to show us that when we sin, we have sinned. <laughs> and therefore, we have a redeemer that we run to in our sin. So he's not dismissing the law. He's just simply saying, listen, you're not justified by the law because the law's job isn't to justify you. And that's what we have to really understand. I think every one of us can understand that to the point right now. We have to understand, like, every time I pick up the, the Torah, if I pick up the Torah or I pick up the entire word of God, this isn't what justifies me. This is just paper. This is And this is just words on a book. This isn't what justifies me. It's the work of the Messiah that justifies me. So even though I fulfill every aspect in this word and I try to hold it and do it and do it and do it, I can't boast even in doing that because it's still justified by the Lord. It, it's not It's not the law. So the law was never meant to justify anybody. The law was meant to reveal our sin and to show us that we have we need we need a savior. So I keep harping that, but I'm sure you guys all all of you guys are really getting that. Okay. So or is God the God of the Jews only? He is uh is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. So he answers his own question here. He's being rhetorical. He's being a good rabbi. He's basically, you know, getting them to think that, oh, wow. Okay, so God is the God of the Gentiles, just like he is the God of the Jews. Amen. Since God is one, and he will justify the circumcised, meaning the Jews, on their ground of faith, or on the ground of faith, and the uncircumcised, the non-Jew, through that same faith. Okay, so again, we got to remember, Paul uses the term circumcision and uncircumcision or circumcised and uncircumcised in the same way he uses this, the terminology to say Jew and Gentile, okay? So when, he's, when you hear, when he says of the circumcision, he means of the Jewish people. If he says of the uncircumcision, he means of the Gentiles. So he's using them in, in uh, synonymous ways here, okay? So he says that, that we're both justified through the same faith and through the same God. Isn't that beautiful? I think this is so beautiful. But what happens a lot of times, what is read into this and what I've heard many pastors say, and I've even heard Messianic rabbis and stuff, they read this and they say, okay, there is no more, there's nothing. The Jews don't matter anymore and the Gentiles don't matter anymore. That's not, that's not what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying everyone matters, whether you're Jew or Gentile. He's actually saying the opposite. And we're all justified by faith in God and God alone because he's the God of the Jews as well as the God of the Gentiles. And you have to understand that we're on the same playing field now through Messiah Yeshua on the same playing field of being justified and made righteous before God. We're on the same playing field. So there is no special status to the Jewish person. There's no special status to the non-Jew. This is what Paul's getting across here. And I think it's beautiful. Then he says this, verse 31, do we then overthrow the law by his faith? By this faith, by no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. <laughs> this drives people crazy. I can't believe how much this passage drives people crazy because they they read it and they think, wait, wait, he just threw out the law. He just threw out the law with the bathwater. He didn't do it at all. That's not what he did at all. He he's basically he defines what the law's work is. He defines what justification is through Messiah only. That God is the Jew. God is the God of the Jew and the Gentile. But we still uphold the law in Messiah Yeshua because it's his standard of living. It's his standard of righteousness. And our righteousness is as filthy rags. That's really what Paul's saying here. It's like, come on, guys, we have work to do. You're saved. You're set free. It doesn't matter if you're Jewish. It doesn't matter if you're Gentile. We have work to do. And that work is to uphold the Torah, the law of God, the ways of God. And I would say right here, if you have your pen or a pencil, if you like to write in your Bible, um, I would say right here. On this, this is by no means, on the contrary, we uphold the law. I would highlight the word law here, put an equal sign to the right of that, that paragraph or anywhere on your Bible, and write the word yare, Y-A-R-E-A, -A, I mean E-H, yare, okay, Y-A-R-E-H, and then put the word right next to it, instructions, okay? so. The Hebrew word for law is Torah. Torah is oftentimes only, oftentimes only, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, translated as law. 
Okay, and that's a kind of a that's kind of not that's kind of a, not a great translation, but it'll stick in everybody's mind that Torah equals law equals bad. That word Torah comes from the y word yare, which means to cast your instructions. So to cast instructions. So the Torah are God's instructions. So when you read that in understanding this word instructions instead of law, and that's more that's a more accurate translation because within the instructions of God are obviously laws, right? If we were to adopt a child or we adopted a little doggy, he's now learning our law, <laughs> right? When Linda eats, She'll stare at him until he looks away, you know, like he doesn't, we, we don't want to meet human food or, or begging, you know, and so when Linda's eating food, she'll start staring at him, look at him, and he starts like feeling totally self-conscious, he's like, he starts moving away, he's like, uh oh, uh oh, what do I do, what do I do, and he starts learning our law, our ways of doing things, okay, our, he's learning our instruction, we're giving him instruction, we're casting our instructions onto him, this is what law means more than anything else, so it's, it, when we look at this, we can sit there and say, do we then overthrow the law or the instructions by this, uh, the instructions of God by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the instructions of God. We uphold the casting of God's word, right? The oracles, the sayings of God, we uphold them in Messiah Yeshua because they're the instructions of God. And so that's what it means more than just this word law or, or Torah is law. And that's all it means. That's not, it's just my, uh, my, uh, a minutia or a, it's just a fragment of what that word means again it comes from the hebrew uh, the root word yare which means to cast like a rabbi or a teacher casting their instructions to his students and so that that's what that word means more than anything so in your bible somehow try to relate relate that or you can just even write next we uphold the law you can put equals instructions of god okay so whatever you have to write in the scriptures there to get you to understand that the law isn't the Torah is not just law. It's the God's ways. It's his instructions. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's continue on chapter four. Does anybody have any questions about that, by the way? That's that's a really hopefully that was an insight to some of you guys. Hope some of you may not have ever heard that. Now, some of you have heard it many times over, but just let it sink in. OK, it's it's a good thing. All right. So let's continue on uh, chapter four. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh, meaning circumcision. So now he's going back. He's talking to the non-Jews about Jewish people in this situation. So again, he's kind of leveling out the playing field, showing that only, it's only through Yeshua. But now he's going, he's talking specifically about him and his heritage as a Jewish person. So we have to keep that in mind here when he's talking. So he goes, he's not like some people will read this and he's, they think he's talking about everybody including gentiles he's not even though gentiles are part of abraham through faith he's talking about the flesh aspect he's talking about the moil right the the circumcision you know <laughs> so uh what then are we to say was gained by abraham our ancestor according to circumcision you could write that in there right for that for if abraham was justified by works he has something to boast about but not before god for what does the scripture say Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. What a great passage. What a great passage. Highlight that, underlined it. Again, that's what Jacob brought up earlier. It wasn't because God circumcised Abraham that made Abraham righteous before God. It was what set Abraham apart. But what really made him righteous was believing in God and getting up with his entire family and moving to the land of Canaan. Right? That was that was an act of faith and um it's pretty powerful and by the way you'll see abraham's father terah was on his way to canaan and stopped if you guys ever read go back and read genesis chapter 11 and 12 you'll see that abraham's dad was actually leading his whole family to canaan to canaan and he stopped he didn't finish the journey and it's kind of some some uh ancient rabbis and some some Christian scholars and other people argue that, you know, that Terah actually had the calling before Abraham, but Terah gave up. And then it was Abraham's job at this point to carry on that calling. And, and you see it, like, like Jacob said, man, he was old in his years and the Lord called him to go forward and move, right? Pretty powerful. So it's that action of faith. And that's what justifies him. What a great passage. Verse four, now to the one who works, wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. 
But to one who without works trusts him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. So he's saying basically, hey, if it was up to works and it was up to you just going to your work and getting things done, then you get wages for that work. Just like going, you know, if you're if you're a carpenter or whatever work you do, you're worth your work. You're worth your wages, right? If you're a carpenter, you're a, you're a scientist or whatever, the work that you do, those wages are that wage in itself justifies your works. But you cannot justify God's ways by doing works because that's not what it's about. It's about faith and it's about Yeshua. So we can't we can't we can't come to it with that. And so that's what he says here. But to the one without work. Trust him who justifies the ungodly. Such faith is reckoned as righteous. So again, trusting in Yeshua is what makes you righteous before him. So also David speaks of the blessedness of those to whom God reckons righteousness apart from works. And then so this is what King David says. Blessed are those whose in iniquity, in iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is one against whom the Lord will not reckon sin. And he lived that out. He understood this. King David understood what it was like. I mean, he committed adultery, he committed murder. He 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 had such a life of of turmoil in so many ways. Um, and then, he, but yet, he, he's the one who wrote Psalm fifty one, you know, Psalm twenty three. He had a heart after God. He he was broken before the Lord. He recognized his sin, and uh, God says that he had a heart after him. That's pretty powerful. Someone someone who lived in Old Testament times. But got to experience the grace of God and even tells us, blessed is, is those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. And we live under a new covenant where the sin, our sins have been covered, completely wiped out. Not just covered, but completely wiped out. He says he takes your sins and he casts them as far as east is from west and he remembers them no more. And east to west isn't like on a globe where it goes around and they connect. East will always go east and west will always go west. And those two shall never meet. And God is taking those sins. And this is why he comes back and says, I remember them no more. Isn't that beautiful? He doesn't remember our sins anymore. Why? It's because he's, he's gotten rid of them, completely got rid of them. The ones who remember our sins are us. <laughs> the ones who remember our failures are us. The ones who remember all that stuff are the people who remind us of it too. <laughs> Right, we we hurt each other more than anything else. But God is forgiven. Now that doesn't mean we don't pay the consequences of it. The Bible says, "Don't be fooled here. God is not mocked. You will you will reap what you have sown." So there is consequences to our sin, and we will experience those consequences from time to time. But I thank God that we are not held, though that they are not held against us, like He says up here in verse eight. Blessed is the one, the one against whom the Lord will not reckon sin. So thank God he's not only forgiven us our sins, but thank the Lord for some of those consequences that he's removed because we deserve death. And he took those consequences of death away, right? Isn't that beautiful? The woman that was found adultery, that was in adultery before the Lord and stood there, he says, hey, where are your accusers? And she looks around, doesn't see him, and he goes, I, I also not accuse you. The one who could have accused her more than what we forget there is when he asked her that question, the only one that was still standing there was him. He was the only one who could have condemned her. And he says, now go, I do not condemn you as well. So go and sin no more. That, isn't that a beautiful picture? We, we, we always look at the Pharisees and the other people surrounding this woman, getting ready to stone this woman, and not the guy who was found in adultery with her because they were both required to get stoned. And so we see that picture there, but we don't realize that, wait, he's the only one standing. He's the last one that's standing that could condemn her, that could carry out the, 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 uh, the death sentence on her. And that he was the only one standing and that she was still at the mercy of him. And he's standing there and he says, now I do not condemn you either. Now go and sin no more. Do you think she sinned anymore after that? <laughs> no, she found grace in, in the Messiah right there and then. And, and I'll tell you, and people say that was Mary Magdalene or whatever, in Magdala. And she followed him around and helped him with the ministry. Praise God, if that's the case, then amen. Amen. I think it's fantastic. I think it's beautiful. I mean, how many of us were found in our adultery, whatever it is, that's just a symbol. And we're so thankful to God because the only one that was standing next to us who condemned us was Yeshua. And Yeshua chose to forgive us instead. That's powerful. 
That's power. Why would we not give up everything and follow him at that point? And so we see that with David. We see that with this lady. And I think that we forget that picture. Go back and read that story again. And it'll blow you out of the water as they all drop their rocks and one, one by one by one uh, walked away. And when he looked at her, he says, where are your accusers? I don't think he was talking from a sense of saying, where are they? He's saying, where are they? The one standing here is the only one who can condemn you. He was revealing his messiahship to this woman. He was revealing his God status to this woman saying, I can condemn you. I can destroy you. And look at, I choose to forgive you. Powerful, powerful when you see it in that picture. Pretty powerful. Okay, so uh, let's move on. Verse nine, is the blessedness then pronounced only on the circumcised or also on the uncircumcised? So he's saying here, is this, is this blessing that David talked about only good for the Jewish people? Or is it also good for the non-Jew? We say faith was reckoned to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it reckoned to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? I love this. It was not after, but before he was circumcised. So Paul is laying. And again, this does not mean the dismissal of the Jewish people. This does not mean the church takes place of Israel. This does not mean that uh, God does not have a calling for the Jewish people. What he's saying simply here is, again, he's talking about justification before God. Justification before God with Abraham was through faith because Abraham believed him. And you remember what Yeshua said to the Pharisees? He says, Abraham, Abraham knows me. <laughs> remember what he said? He goes, what? How can a Vinu Abraham, how can our father Abraham know? You're not even 50 years old. But what was funny about that when they said that was like, even if he was 50 years old, he still wouldn't have been close to Abraham. He still wouldn't have not known Abraham. That's what's really funny about that little story. You can see a little bit of like humor kind of coming out of this whole thing. It's like he had to be something like, you know, uh, uh, yeah, th uh, about 1500 years old or something or like that, you know, but. But in this situation here, he's standing there, and basically what he's saying here is he's saying, guys, like, to be justified, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. And that's what he's getting across. Because even Abraham, our father, the father of many nations, the father of many faith, right? He's the father of three, three world religions at this point, and he's the father of many people. But we know he's the father of Judaism, the father of Christianity, the father of Islam in modern days. OK, but and it was because of faith. But here specifically, he's saying all this took place before he was circumcised. So circumcision isn't where it's at. And this is what Paul understood from Jerus the Jerusalem Council when we read in the book of Acts, where in Acts chapter 15, where they had to send out a letter to the non-Jews. Because remember the argument when you guys look at Acts chapter 15, it's called the Jerusalem Council. And they said, hey, listen, all these non-Jews are getting saved and they're not even circumcised. They're being brought in through the fold and there was an argument. Well, they, they need to get circumcised. They need to do this and they do that. Paul learned from that time period on there that it had nothing to do with that. It had everything to do with faith in Yeshua the Messiah, in your justification before him. Oftentimes that is used as a means to get rid of the law but that's not what Paul's saying here. He's not saying it at all. He's not talking about any dismissal of the Torah, any dismissal of the law at all. He's talking about your justification before the Lord. Okay? So then we see that there, and then we continue on. Uh, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Amen. That's pretty straightforward. The purpose was to make him the ancestor of all who believe without being circumcised and who thus have righteousness reckoned to them. So he's welcoming the non-Jews here. He's saying, hey, guys, this was all done so that he can become the ancestor to all of us, Jew and non-Jew alike. And likewise, the ancestor of the circumcised. He's also the, an the ancestor of the Jewish people who are not only circumcised, but who also follow the example of, of the faith that our ancestor Abram had before he was circumcised. So again, it's talking here, it's not just for, just because you're outwardly circumcised, that is part of the calling in your life, but it's not salvation. It's not being justified before the Lord, okay? So that's really important. I mean, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago and it was really hard um, working through that process, but we're justified through Yeshua and Yeshua only, amen? Okay, verse 13 here. So, for the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, or again here through just the instructions, but through the righteousness of faith. Amen. Again, accepting Yeshua as the Messiah. If it, if it 
is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. Okay, let's stop there. Anybody know what that's saying right there at the very end? Let's read that again. It says, if it is the adherents or the uh, adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. So right there in verse 14, he's saying, if it's by through the Torah, if it's just for the Jewish people, then hey, having faith and the promise of God, there's no reason to have faith at all. It's just dull and void. There's, there's no reason to live. Basically, everything that we're trying to do is wrong. So if that's the case of having faith and, and accepting the promises of God, if it was done just through the Torah and becoming Jewish, then you know what? All of us have to get circumcised. All of us have to convert to Judaism. All of us have to follow uh, the, the law exactly and, and do it exactly right, or none of us are justified. So that's what Paul is saying here, right? He's saying basically, listen, guys, if that's the only way, and through that inheritance, if that's the only way, then faith, having faith like Abraham, that doesn't mean nothing. Faith and trust in Messiah Yeshua, that doesn't mean nothing. It's all about the Torah, so we might as well just get rid of the promises of God, get rid of the the uh, the the faith of God, of trusting God, and just follow the Torah. Unfortunately, we're seeing that happen in many uh, Messianic or Hebrew Hebrew roots uh, uh, congregations. We see that happen in a lot of a lot of different means. We see that happen in nominal Judaism today so um, we know it's through faith but he brings this up so then he goes here verse 15 and the last part for the law brings wrath but where there is no law there is uh, neither is there violation so again he's just reiterating again that what the law does is recognize sin and that because it recognizes sin it has to deal with the consequences of sin therefore that's where the wrath comes in OK, the, it's it, it's it, it's it brings the knowledge of sin. And so therefore, if you're caught in adultery, the law says you have to be stoned. That's because it's designed to do that. It's telling you the, the sin and the consequences of sin. And that's where he says that's where the wrath of it comes. But where there is no law. And again, we know that there is no law that comes against upholding the law. So there's no instructions against upholding the instructions of God. So when we go speed limit 55 miles an hour and it's 55 miles an hour is the speed limit, we travel that distance. There's no law against doing that except for the fact that we're, we're, we're upholding the law. That's what he's saying here. Okay, so and he says, neither is there any violation. None of us will ever get a ticket for going the speed limit unless we're swerving all over. We can go, I guess, if you're going 55 miles an hour and you're, or you're going the speed limit and you're just swerving all over the place and not using blinkers and they pull you over. Well, I'm going 55, you know. Yeah, but you can't drive erratically. You can't write da write, drive dangerously. Um, you know, then you you then you find yourself under the law again. Um, Junior, you have your hand raised. Oh yeah, I mean, and the law came like four hundred and thirty years after, right? So it's like the law wasn't even um, in the time of Abraham. So it was like about faith, right? Yeah. Yes and yes and no. Yes and no. I think there's been mm -hmm. a lot of debate on that. The actual written law came many years later, and you're correct in that. When it was written yeah. and inscribed by God, put on the Ten Commandments and brought forth through Moses and brought forth, forth through the people, yes. But there's always been an understanding of God's ways and his instructions. How did Cain and Abel know how to sacrifice? Mm -hmm. God walked with them in the cool of the day. How did Noah know how to bring on seven uh, or clean and unclean animals and have seven clean animals and two unclean animals, right? That's true. He had, he had the clean animals to, to eat uh, for him and his family to eat while they were on the on the ark. And the, of the unclean animals, they only had two, right? Mm -hmm. So he brought them two, two by two into the ark. So God's, and see, this is where we have to get away from that terminology of law and Torah. Well, the Torah wasn't even written down, da, 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 so we don't have any, you know, a lot of people say this. So they argue, well, I don't have to follow the Torah because it didn't come out till then. And Abraham walked by faith. Well, wait, wait, God's instructions have always been there. God is Amen. God, and God will always be God, and God will always teach righteousness and walk in righteousness and always bestow his ways unto his children. So if you picture God walking in the cool of day with Adam and Eve, what do you think he was talking to them about? You know, he was imparting Amen. into them. 
the instructions of life and of 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 righteousness and and health and everything else he probably was teaching them how to use herbs and and um you know and how to use the restroom properly <laughs> neener, neener, neener. Look, the only one who's laughing here is jacob because it's it's a joke it's an inward joke so i will tell you guys it's just kind of fun that me and linda give each other a hard time about okay but god was teaching them the instructions that would carry and give them life right so even though the law and that junior was a good thing even though it didn't come out into fashion and formed and put down on paper or or parchment or skin <laughs> or tablets you know i love mel gibson's version better we were watching the ten commandments last night but i like mel gibson's where he's like i give you you remember in the history of the world part one or part two or something i give you the 15 he drops one the 10 10 <laughs> commandments <laughs> If you guys have never seen that, that, that scene is classic. I love it. Mel, I'm not Mel Gibson, Mel Brooks. I'm sorry. I said Mel, Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks. Yeah. He's carrying three tablets, you know, and he's got Mel Brooks got three tablets. I give you the fifth, the 10, the 10 commandments. It's, it's great. It's really, really great. So even though the Torah was written many years later than this part right here, the instructions of God and the faith in those instructions have always been known to some degree but it became more defined especially especially when it went from abraham to isaac to jacob and it became very precise right we talked about covenants you know how covenants were all for all mankind like the noah noah covenant with the rainbow was for all mankind right but as time went by god had to choose a particular people to become the light to the nations to reveal his ways to the nations because his instructions were being lost and people were doing evil and wickedness and just doing whatever they want to do. So he had to get a group of people. And that's the calling of the Jewish people is to present God's ways to the nations so that the nations may see God and see the light of God and come back into that light, like a, like a bug flying, you know, to, you know, at nighttime at a campfire, <laughs> he turned on the little buzz. <laughs> okay, that's yeah so this, this, I'm, sorry. I'm sorry that's a good question junior but um that is truly that's where that's where uh we have to understand that so again the law we can say yeah it was written at a particular time the law en encompasses this and we have to do this here's the consequences for all that and this came out years later but they understood these things they understood some of these things the ways of god especially because it was just god had instructed them himself and through the prophets and through other things that took place you know and um, i mean how did how did abraham recognize the 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 lord how did he recognize the angel of the lord right i mean it's it's pretty amazing true so pretty powerful imagery here but we got to remember that god's instruct if god is you know hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 says that jesus messiah or it says yeshua the messiah the same yesterday today, today and forever, forever. Yeshua has never changed. God has never changed. And his ways were the same at the time of creation as his ways are today. And anytime we dismiss his instructions or we say it's no lock, it's nailed to the cross, we're not really understanding what Shaul was saying here. We're not really, I mean, we did not nail the instructions of God to the cross. And Yeshua did not nail the instruction of the, of the, of, of the Father to the cross. He gave us the freedom and the grace to walk in faith to understand that it's not through the works but through faith and then also through the aspect of saying okay now i have a responsibility to walk in that calling that god desires of me and his instructions are the best way to walk in this world it's really amen. Good amen all right any amen. other questions guys and we'll we'll finish off here so uh, put down here that next week we'll start in uh chapter 4 verse 16 okay chapter 4 verse 6 is that where we're at yeah, we ended, uh, yeah, chapter 4, verse 16. So uh, chapter 4, verse 16, does anybody want to add anything or say anything? Uh, Jacob? Uh, you were talking about like how uh, they're like, oh, you know, he he was not like that, that many years old that he saw Abraham. My favorite, okay, Yeshua has so many mic drop moments in, in the New Testament. My favorite one is when he goes, Abraham saw my day and he was thrilled. I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's powerful. And, you know, it's funny, like 
man, this guy's Meshuggah. What is he talking about? He's not even 50 years old. And he's like, how can you know Abraham, our father? You're not even 50 years old. And he goes, oh, I tell you, Abraham, I knew. You didn't, but I did. <laughs> I, I think it's this great conversations that he had back and forth. Um, uh, anything else? Anybody want to add on here? Okay, great. It was a good study tonight, guys. I hope you got a lot out of it. I hope you guys understood this. Uh, just in summary, in quick summary, is that we are justified alone in Yeshua the Messiah. And it doesn't matter, Jew or non-Jew. We don't have any boasting that we can do. There's nothing that I can boast about in the sense of my walk with God that makes me justified and righteous before God. I'm thankful that I have the the grace that was been given to me by God to walk in his ways and that when I fail, I can run to him and I can ask God for forgiveness because I failed. And I have, I, th I thank God that I have that grace given to me by Linda. And Linda has that grace given to me as well is that if we, if we fail in our marriages or we hurt one another, or say things that we can say that we've been given the grace by each other to come and ask for forgiveness. The same kind of relationship that we have here. We have that relationship with God in a, in a huge expounding way. So I'm so thankful for that. But it's not the length of my seat seat. It's not going through the prayers and putting on the prayer just the right way, wrapping up my tefillin the, the proper way, wrapping it around here, having it say El Shaddai around my arm. It's none of that stuff makes me righteous before God. None of that. None of that. It's upholding the law in Yeshua because it's all about Yeshua and it's all through faith. So it's a beautiful thing. And if we fail, we have Yeshua that draws us back to the Father so we can get back on track. It's like the say the old saying, uh, if you fall off the horse, get up again, right? Mm -hmm. or how, how's that saying go? Uh, get back on. Get, get back on again. If you, if in Old Testament times, sometimes when you fell off the horse, you were done. <laughs> You were done, <laughs> okay? But that is simply because that's the consequence of the law. And, but there was still means of forgiveness even in those days that if it says that if someone had sinned or you sinned against your neighbor and you do all that kind of stuff, you can, or you destroyed their donkey, you bring another donkey or a ox, or you come to the, you come to the, um, uh, to the temple and offer the sacrifice. If you committed murder, if you made it to the, the city of refuge before you were, you were uh, caught, there was a means of grace there that you had means in a way to uh, to survive enough to make rec recompense for what took place. But just the law itself, it has always been designed to, to reveal the knowledge of sin in your life and the knowledge of the consequences. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth type of thing. It's just, it's a standard that is there that shows us that none of us are righteous before God. But so our righteousness comes through the Father. Amen. Amen. Well, Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for this study. Lord, we glorify you and exalt you, Lord. And we are so thankful for all that you've done. In Yeshua's name, amen.